Good evening. It's time to begin our Wednesday night Bible class here at Alkire Road. We appreciate all those that are live streaming the Bible class, and we hope that you've had a good week this week, and uh, we are looking forward to coming together on the Lord's Day this Sunday, if it be the Lord's will. So uh, just a few announcements I'd like to uh, mention to the congregation. Uh, please keep in mind those who are still dealing with health issues. Please be with, uh, keep in mind Susan Drake as she is still recovering. Um, she could really use uh, our prayers and, and cards and, and phone calls. Um, please keep her in, in mind as you uh, uh, do those good works. Uh, also, remember M Melissa. Uh, Melissa just went through hip replacement surgery, uh, and she is recovering. Uh, so please keep her in your prayers, as well as Ronnie Millett with, with his heart issues that he has been dealing with. Uh, from what I understand, Barb Bowling uh, did go to get a heart catheter, but uh, apparently um, they could not put any stents in. Um, and they could not do surgery. So uh, from what I understand, she is going to go through some extensive um, rehab and some other things that uh, is gonna be needed uh, for about five days a week for the next several weeks. So please keep Barb in your prayers as she is dealing with that. Uh, I know Brian is home now, but he is st still dealing with the infection in his foot so please keep him in your prayers. And also remember that uh, John Slane will be having a procedure this uh, upcoming month and on the 28th. So please keep him in, in your prayers as well. Also um, got note that the Ohio winter lectures are coming up at the end of this month. I believe that's on the 29th and 30th. Uh, I know there are several here at this congregation who have attended these in the past. Um, this year's session will be live streaming only due to COVID-19. So, um, and I think you, you can find that out on YouTube, but there'll be more information available this coming Sunday. I believe we'll have some flyers out uh, listing the speakers and the topics in the different times. So please keep that uh, in your uh, calendar as well. That is all the announcements I have, so before we get into our lesson, let's bow uh, and have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the many blessings that you bestow upon us. We're thankful for your love for us. We're thankful that you are God and creator. We're thankful for the church that you have provided for us, uh, a way in which we could come together to worship you. Uh, we know, Heavenly Father, that that you have uh, made it possible that, that people who, who love you and want to do your will can be obedient, can worship you in spirit and truth uh, through the church. And we're so thankful for that. We're thankful for those uh, within the kingdom. Uh, we're so thankful for this congregation, especially Heavenly Father, that you have blessed us in so many ways. We pray that you will continue uh, to help us in our efforts, uh, give us strength and, and courage to do what is right and to be faithful to you. We pray as we go through our study this evening that you would give us understanding of the things that we read from your word and make correct applications to them to our lives. We ask all these things in Jesus' name and amen. As I mentioned last week, this quarter, we are going to study the topic of church discipline. And last week, we talked about how important the church is to God and how we are to have that same mindset when we think about the church and the work of the church, that we are to prioritize the church as the top priority in our own lives. If members of the Lord's body do not hold the church in the same regard, with the same love as what we see from our God, 
then how can we be effective in reaching the lost so they can be added to the Lord's body? So it's vital that members of the Lord's church remember that the church should be what is first in our lives. Today, t t tonight we're going to start, even though last week we, we talked about the importance of the church, tonight we're going to look into a little more about this subject of church discipline. Does church discipline matter? And why is it, in fact, necessary? Um, who should be administering church discipline? We're going to dive into several of these questions and... Um, see what God's word has to say regarding church discipline. Think about when Christ prayed to the Heavenly Father in John chapter 17. In verses 20 and 21, we read, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Christ prayed that his followers would be one. Why would Christ pray such a thing that his followers were one? Well, we see just as he was one with the Heavenly Father, we see that the world can see the church being one with the Father, and it would make sense that the church, or that those who, who desire to be righteous, who desire to follow after God's commands, would want to be part of that oneness with, with God. Think about how it makes sense that the world should be able to see us and, and see how we are one and want to be part of that. If the church is one with God and following after his word, obeying what he has given us to worship him, to be part of this body, to be part of Christ, and to live righteously, then the world would want to be part of something like that. As we discussed a little bit last week, man, man cannot be saved without the church. We read in Ephesians 5.23 where Christ is the Savior of the body. And Scripture also teaches us that the body cannot stand if it is divided. You know, this principle is taught by Christ himself. Remember when the Pharisees uh, knew that Jesus was performing miracles, and then they began to attribute uh, those miracles, and especially casting out evil spirits, they, they began to attributing that to the powers of Beelzebub. Remember what Christ said uh, about that in Matthew 12, 25. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought down or brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. Every kingdom divided against itself is to brought, be brought to desolation, the Lord says. You know, Jesus goes on to say that if Satan would cast out his own, then he would be divided against himself. And how shall his kingdom stand? Well, it wouldn't. The lesson being that any kingdom divided from within will fall. Can we not say this about the kingdom of God? Within the local congregation, what if there is division within a body? What if the church has members who are doing things of the world within that body? How will those who are seeking the truth, seeking a place to worship God, how will they look at the church if there is division such as that? Do you think those who are seeking God will want to associate with a church where there's no difference between the church and the world? Those who realize that God wants them to come out of the world and be separate, 
How can they do that if the church they are being added to is no different than the world? We have been given direction for how a body of the Lord's church should handle a situation such as this. We have up here in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the first five verses say this, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from you. For I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already, as though I were present, concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, and my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. The church at Corinth should have been mourning. Why should they have been mourning? Well, for one reason, because of the sinful choice of this erring brother. However, the other reason that they should have been mourning is because they should have already exercised church discipline and withdrawn fellowship from this erring brethren. And as we read in Hebrews 12, 11, as we discussed last week, that discipline is not going to be a joyous occasion. It's going to be a grievous occasion. And the church should have been mourning because of this action. Not, not that they took the action, but because that one of their own had decided to sin against God. Notice what else discipline was designed to do as we continue reading in 1 Corinthians 5. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. So we see another purpose of discipline is in, in, is in order to keep the congregation pure. Sin within the church can easily spread, just as leaven does in a lump of dough. Removal of sin from within the church will help the remaining to be pure and to stay away from sin. Last week we made mention about the seven churches of Asia, which we have been studying uh, Revelation in, in, on Sunday nights, but as Tim was talking about chapters 2 and 3, we see that these congregations were in jeopardy of falling. And if they did not repent and return to their first love, their candlestick would be removed. They would no longer be considered among those of the faithful body of Christ. It is important that we recognize that God has designed discipline uh, to be part of the family. Last week we also talked about how in passages such as Hebrew 12 that church discipline is likened unto parental discipline. This was true with God's people in the Old Testament as well. We read in, in Deuteronomy where Moses uh, said to God's people in chapter 8 and verse 5, Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. We also see God's people under the new covenant, under Christ, where those who are, at, who are his at times need correction. How often do we read of the faithful uh, being referenced as a family within the New Testament? We see in several places. In fact, in, in Galatians 3.26, it says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 1.5 says, Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. And Ephesians 5.1, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. 
we see this reference as a family, as a body, how we as the body of church are a family. And just as God's children needs correction and discipline, how they needed it under the Old Testament, so too does he provide that same care and that same love to those under the new covenant. Within a family, God has specified that there is to be discipline. And this has not changed from God's word. No matter if we're speaking about our physical families, he has instructed us to exercise discipline, or if we're talking about our spiritual family, such as the church, we are to exercise church discipline. You know, we often refer to 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 as how we understand the inspiration of the Bible. But notice what it is also profitable for. It is profitable for reproof, for correction, and instruction in righteousness. Two out of three of the benefits we see of God's inspired word deals with this idea of discipline, reproof, and correction. Yes, we learn with instruction, uh, but we also learn with reproof and correction. You know, as children, I'm sure that we would prefer to learn through instruction. You know, we would prefer to someone to, to teach us verbally and, and gain that understanding and that knowledge. But so too, as uh, children, of uh, spiritual children, there, we not only need that instruction through verbally, but sometimes that needs to come with reproof and correction. And God desires that his children be accountable. Just as godly parents have been given instruction to discipline their children, and they will be held accountable for how they raise their children, God has also instructed discipline to be administered within the church. And there is an accountability, accountability for this responsibility as well. If we are to be the church that God expects, then we will obey God's command and exercise church discipline. Last week, I mentioned uh, a book that Kyle Butt had written on church discipline. And within his book, I um, quoted one of the, the things that he mentioned in his book. It was commandments for the church to exercise church discipline are some of the more explicit commands that we have been commanded to do. Now, that doesn't mean it's always popular for us to exercise this discipline. Remember the words Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 4.2. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. This means that we are to be constant. We continually reprove and rebuke, not only when everybody agrees it should be done, but also when it's not popular to do. And one of the questions that is often raised is, who is responsible for administering church discipline? We understand that God has sanctioned discipline to be done, but how is it to be administered? And who is to administer it? Now, there is no doubt that elders have the responsibility in taking the lead in exercising church discipline. It is understandable why elders are to meet certain criteria before they are qualified in shepherding the flock. One reason is the fact that they can be diligent in carrying out God's command for discipline and not be to blame themselves. Turn with me to Titus chapter 1, and you could see from verses 6 through 8, we have the qualifications spelled out for an elder. But notice right after these, qual these qualifications in verse 9. Verse 9 says, Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. 
The Greek word for convince here carries a stronger meaning than what we may think of when we think of trying to convince someone of something. This word means to convict or to rebuke or to reprove. And the word gainsayers that we read here in the King James Version means those who speak against the truth, those who contradict God's word. And notice as we continue reading in this passage in, in Titus in verses 10 and 11, for there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. Elders have been given charge to stop those who are unruly, who are vain speakers and deceivers. They are to do this by exercising church discipline. They have been directed to stop the unruliness. However, this is not to say that elders are the only ones responsible for exercising church discipline. In fact, we know that there are some congregations of the Lord's church who do not even have elders. Are they excused for exercising church discipline? Notice what we read in, in Galatians 6, 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fall, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Those who are spiritual have been given direction to restore those overtaken in a fall. Now that can mean an elder, for sure, uh, but that can also mean faithful brethren. The word for spiritual means non-carnal. As Christian, that is what we are to be. We're to be spiritual. We're to be non-carnal. And we have a duty when we see a brother or sister taken in a fault to restore them. And we're, we're also, from this passage, given guidance on how this is to be done in a spirit of meekness considering ourselves, lest we also be tempted. Church discipline is not just something for the elders to worry about. The command to discipline has given, been given to the entire body. Think about this. What happens if a congregation leaves all the disciplining to the elders? Well, think, it a, think of it in regards to parenting. What if one parent took on all the responsibility of exercising discipline within the home. And what if the other parent didn't support it or didn't feel it was necessary or was not in support of it being done at all? What happens to this family unit? What if each time a father who would administer loving discipline to their child that child would then go to their mother and that mother would say that, oh, that shouldn't have been done and, and complain about the discipline and not support that discipline. What do you think would develop within that child? What would be their reaction to the discipline? Would they learn to respect discipline and adhere to it or would they be resentful of it? each time it is administered. Would the child be more or less likely to repent in those situations? Think about the parent who's handling the discipline, the lack of support that they would have in that situation. Disciplining is a difficult thing to do. And if you don't have the support of your spouse, of your family unit, those within your family, how much more difficult does it become? In the same way, if members of the Lord's body do not support discipline within the church and they leave it up all to the elders or just a select group of people, what begins to happen within that family unit? There becomes a lack of respect for the purpose of discipline. There is no repentance over sin, but there's resentment toward the elders or those carrying out that discipline uh, within the body. Also, there's division that begins to happen within the body. Division easily creeps in, and when members do not support nor participate 
and exercising discipline, then that kingdom becomes divided. The church becomes divided. And we know from Christ's words in Matthew 12, 25, that a kingdom divided cannot stand. And when one chooses not to condemn the unrighteous deeds, they too fall into condemnation. I want you to think about that. That when we read in Scripture that those who do not condemn unrighteousness, they are just as guilty. Look at Romans chapter 1 with me. If you read through Romans chapter 1, especially towards the end of the chapter there, it talks about those who are unrighteous. It talks about uh, those individuals who are fornicators, murderers, haters of God, covenant breakers, those disobedient to parents, those who are unmerciful. And when we see the last verse in the chapter, we see this verse, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. This word pleasure means to allow, to assent, or to think well of. Those who are worthy of death, speaking of spiritual death here, will not only be those who do such wickedness, but it also is to those who consent or think well of those that do such things. You know, while we are to love every person, God has mandated that we show love and that we demonstrate love to, to every person. That does not necessitate that we are to support those who are engaged in living in sin. Notice the condemnation here that we find in Romans 1.32. It's not, implica it's not implicating those who may have pleasure in the actual deeds. I mean, we know from other passages that we are not to, to partake in evil deeds, that those who take pleasure in sin will not see the kingdom of heaven. But here in this passage, the condemnation is directed at those who have pleasure, who allow, support, or think well of the people who do these deeds. There are those who may not advocate for sin. Uh, they may not, you know, participate in it. They may not support those things that God calls sin. But maybe they have close friends. Maybe they have relatives who are participating in such sin. And they think that they should be left alone and not be rebuked or reproved for the life of sin they are leaving. Brethren, if we become so callous that we do not rebuke sin, that we don't see sin as it is, that we do not point out that this is against God, then we are in jeopardy of the same condemnation as those participating in that sin. I've often heard justification that, well, this sin is a lifestyle, and some individuals can't help but to be this way. Or they, they make the argument that God made me this way. We need to remember that, that in James chapter 1, and verse 13, it says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. In Isaiah 5.20, we read of a warning of those who would call evil good or those who call good evil. This passage indicates that these individuals have put in place darkness for light and they have chose bitter instead of sweet. And brethren, if we support this kind of thinking and accept those individuals who are living in sin, we too have chosen darkness rather than light. And we know, as we see from this warning in Romans 1.32, that God will pass judgment on not only those who practice such things, but those who support those things as well. As a righteous body of the church, let us not be found to support them that live in sin, no matter how much the world says it is okay, that it's right, that it's just another lifestyle. 
we must realize that this judgment comes by God. And as the Lord's body, if we want to be known of being of our Father, we too will st take a stand for righteousness. Paul, in writing to the Christian brethren at Corinth, said in 1 Corinthians 6, 2, Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? I realize in this context, Paul was referring to those within the church who are uh, going against their brother and going to, to law and going to court against their br brother. And, and he's rebuking them and saying, you know, you can handle this situation within the church. However, in this verse in particular, Paul also notes that the saints shall judge the world. I personally understand this to mean that the stance we make as the Lord's church, the life that we live as saints, stands in contrast to those in the world and brings judgment and condemnation to them. And even though the world may deem sin as acceptable and just a lifestyle, the church is to stand against such behavior. And as a member of the Lord's body, knowing God's judgment against unrighteous behavior, God expects us not to waver, but to stand for righteousness, to abhor that which is evil. Are we doing what God wants us to do, or are we doing what the world thinks is right? Think about if we have one within the church who is guilty of such unrighteousness. And there are those within the church, maybe relatives or close friends, who want to just let that, that member be and, and not do anything that's going to upset the cart. They, they don't want to make waves. And maybe they make the argument, I know they're not living as they should, but exercising discipline is just going to do more harm than it is good. Who gets to make the determination of what Christ's church should be doing or shouldn't be doing? Obviously, it is the one who is the head of the church, that being Christ. Are there some within the part of the body that even though they begin to live unrighteous, will fall away? And are we within the body, or are we just to write them off and think, well, you know, they weren't that influential. They weren't that important. So we'll just let them drift off and, and never be part of the body again. In 1 Corinthians 12, we read where every member of the body is important. In verses 25 and 26, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. We are to rejoice with them that rejoice and weep with them that weep. The body must be together in times of rejoicing and in, when in sorrow. Even if that sorrow means it is exercising discipline upon those within the body. Think about how effective a relationship is when the family unit is united together in love like God designed it to be. Whether every member, where every member is important and significant to the functioning of the body and how effective it is when the church exercises discipline the way God has designed it. But, but what good is discipline if it's not administered? Have you ever witnessed a parent who threatens to discipline their child but never acts upon it? Johnny, if you throw that rock one more time, you're going to be in big trouble. Then after a half dozen warnings from the parent, the parent finally gets up, fed up from warning him so many times to go over to him, and then to find that he starts throwing a tantrum and cries on the floor as the parent turns and walks back and continues what they're doing. What happens in a situation like that? You know, does the children, does the child learn anything if no discipline is administered? Well, think about the Lord's church. 
What happens within a church when exercise, when discipline has been exercised, maybe by the elders of an erring member, yet there are those within the body, within the church, who don't support that, who don't exercise that discipline. Maybe they, they continue to do the things that they've always done with that individual. They still go out to eat with them. They still hang out with them. Uh, they still uh, talk with them and associate with them. And, and there's never any talk of, of repenting. What good does that do to the soul of that individual who is living their life in sin? How, how will this help the soul of that individual uh, on the day of judgment? We need to have a love and concern for our brethren, love enough to realize that discipline is necessary. So think about the fact that there may be confusion on many on what the intent for discipline really is. If I were to ask you, what is the purpose of church discipline? What would you tell me the, why it is done? Well, again, those who are parents, if I were to ask you, why do you discipline your children? What answer would you provide? It wouldn't be the answer that you're looking for an opportunity to inflict pain on your child. It wouldn't be that you want to get back at them uh, for something they had done to you. It wouldn't be because you're you see you have gratification in the fact that you you see them suffer uh, and you really don't care about them obviously that is not the case so too the righteous body of Christ does not have a vendetta when they are exercising church discipline the reason for church, church discipline being done should be out of love for that individual they want to see that soul saved in the day of the Lord. You would not look at a father or mother in a family and say that they are disciplining their children because they have something against their children. No, they love their children and they want what's best for them. That is why they discipline. And we see this, the same reason, in the church. We read from last week, Revelation 3.19, where the Lord says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. And we looked at Hebrews 12, 6. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. There is love for one being disciplined. And that should be the reason for discipline and the motivation behind it. There is a genuine care for their soul. It is not be, being done because there, is no de, because there is a desire to punish or to cause them harm but a desire to see them return to the fold. And as we read earlier in 1 Corinthians, the last verse there, we are to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. What demonstrates the most care for them whom we love? Is it not their eternal soul? Our concern should be for that erring brother or sister's soul and save them in the day of the Lord. And as elders, the elders have a responsibility to look after the souls of the fold and give an account for them. And this must be something that they take high priority over and making sure that the souls are are doing what God wants them to do and if discipline is needed in acting upon that. Back in the 1980s, there was an incident that occurred in the Lord's church that seemed to have a major impact on the Lord's body ac across the country. Time magazine even had an article written about the incident and entitled it, Marion and the Elders. Some of you may have remembered this incident and, and remember details about the situation. The Time Magazine article proceeded to summarize a court case in which a member of the church uh, located in Collinsville um, 
It was the Collinsville Church of Christ near Tulsa, Oklahoma. This woman of the church sued her eldership for $1.3 million for alleged damages she received from being disfellowshipped. And the events was the fact that this, this member of the church came to the Collinsville Church of Christ, placing membership with her, with them, and she had already been divorced at that time. But a few years later, she started to engage in an ongoing sexual relationship with a man in Collinsville. She confessed this sin, this sinful relationship, to the elders, but refused to repent of her sin and removed herself uh, and refused to remove herself from the situation. On three different occasions, the elders at the Collinsville Church confronted her about the sinful lifestyle that she was living, but she continued in it and refused to repent. The elders proceeded with the withdrawal and exercised church discipline as God instructed them to do. As it turns out, from the original verdict of the lawsuit, the Tulsa jury sided with Marion and in the initial ruling that took place in 1984, granted her $390,000. Within the Time Magazine article, it mentioned that the amount awarded would be more than that congregation's total proceeds for six years. And that was based on their average contribution. Also within the article, after the verdict, Marion, a member of the Lord's Church, was quoted as saying, a wrong was made right. Also within the article, it provided a statement Marion made in the courtroom. She said, speaking of the incident, I'm not saying I wasn't guilty. I was, but it was none of their business. Her lawyer likened the church, church's actions to the public branding of the adulteress in Hawthorne's book, The Scarlet Letter. The lawyer said of the relationship Marion was engaged in, he was a single man and she was a single lady and this is America. Some of you may know that Phil Donahue picked up this story. And for those who don't know who Phil Donahue uh, is, he was a television talk show host. But he picked up the story and invited Marion and her lawyers to appear on the show, along with a represent, uh, representative sampling of various members of the Church of Christ. And Garland Elkins of the Memphis School of Preaching also appeared on the show as an unofficial spokesman for the Churches of Christ. And Phil Donahue would ask Garland Elkins a question to which Brother Garland would respond primarily with a verbatim uh, quote from the scriptures. And as questions continued to come from the audience and from Phil Donahue, most were answered with quotes from scripture. Finally, one woman in the audience was given the floor, and she, in so many words, said, I know what your people's problem is. You are blinded by the Bible. Now, what was lost by the media and others was that scriptural authority had been observed, and a body of the Lord's church stood for righteousness. And there should have been much rejoicing in the fact that even in the face of persecution, in a lawsuit, God's people persevered. However, this situation caused a real fear in the Lord's church regarding church discipline. Kyle Butt, in his book, mentions this incident, and he writes, Some within the Brotherhood, even decades after this event, would reference what happened in Collinsville to be a word of caution when thinking about church discipline. Kyle says that, unfortunately, in elders' meetings or men's meetings, where the subject of church discipline was brought up, there would be some who would make the comment, you remember what happened in Collinsville. Kyle goes on to make the statement, how many times have congregation of the Lord's body in this country continued to allow sinful men and women to sit undisciplined and unchecked in their assemblies because they were afraid of a lengthy, costly court battle? Remember Collinsville became the battle cry, or more importantly, became the um, retreat uh, whispered into the ear of conscientious brethren throughout the United States.
Can you imagine Peter or John considering whether or not they were going to get sued or lose money if they preached the gospel of Christ? Indeed not. In fact, we read in, in Acts 5 there where uh, John and, and Peter were directed not to teach in the name of Christ. And Peter responds there, we ought to obey God rather than man. The verdict for Marion to receive $390,000 was eventually appealed and um, it went to the Oklahoma Supreme Court. In that appeal, the Supreme Court reversed the judgment and remanded that the case be tried again. And the case was then settled out of court. After the verdict, I think it's interesting that one of the elders of the Collinsville Church of Christ, Roy Witten, was quoted to say within the Time article, if Marion were to come back tomorrow, indicating her repentance of this sin, we would welcome her with open arms and the angels in heaven would join with us. As a body of Christ, we cannot fear what men may do to us for obeying the commandments of God. And we must also realize that we are taking such actions as church discipline out of love that are care and concern for the brethren or sister soul. And we should not fear what men may do to us for obeying God's word. We'll conclude our lesson for tonight and, and we will pick up again next week. But we should remember that that God desires us that we are obedient to his commands, even when it's difficult, even when it's hard, even when it's not a joyous thing to do and it's grievous for us to do. We are still commanded to do what God has commanded us to do. As a body of the Lord's church, we are to be faithful in carrying out those commands. And if we want to be known as a church of God, if we want to be known as a body where our candlestick is not being removed, then we're going to follow after all the commands of Christ. And church discipline being one of those that, that we have to follow. I pray that this lesson will have helped you this evening. As we go through the rest of this quarter, please remember, as I said last week, that our desire is, is not to browbeat the congregation, not to uh, tell the congregation of, of bad things that are coming or anything of that nature, but it's to teach the truth and to be God-fearing uh, people, a body known for doing what is right. Let's go to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the many blessings you give us. We're thankful for the church and the blessings that we can uh, have for being part of your family. We know, Heavenly Father, that being part of a family means that, that there are sometimes a, a necessary uh, aspect of discipline that, that is involved. We pray that when we are disciplined that we will receive it patiently, that we will repent when we are wrong, and that we will come back to the church, for we know that salvation is in the kingdom, in the church. We pray that you help us uh, on our day-to-day -day walk, that we will live righteously, that we will not do those things that will bring reproach upon ourselves or reproach upon the church. We pray that you forgive us when we do err. We pray that uh, we will remember that you love us and that you care for us and that you are always willing to forgive us if we will repent of those things that we do. We're so thankful for the blessings we have in the church we're so thankful that we can go to you in prayer. We can call you our Father. And we pray that you help us to, to always remember that the kingdom is to come first in our lives. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.